Hey, this is Mike Matthews from MustfulLife.com, and in this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Ben Greenfield. Ben is a best-selling author. Uh, he has a, a book that just came out recently called Beyond Training that I liked and that I recommended in one of my Cool Stuff of the Week posts. Um, he's also a, a coach, a speaker, and an Ironman triathlete. Uh, you can find him over at BenGreenfieldFitness.com. Um, and also you might be familiar with uh, his podcast, which is pretty popular, called the Get Fit Guy podcast. Uh, Ben's a consultant for a company called Wellness FX and also a nutritionist and kind of head coach over at Pacific Elite Fitness. And as you'll see, he knows his stuff. And also I like that he lives this. I mean, he's a competitive athlete, so he's trying all kinds of things. And uh, in a lot of cases, it takes time for, for scientific research to ca catch up with people that are kind of uh, on the on the cutting edge of, of trying everything that they can get their hands on to improve recovery, improve performance, and that also, um, you know, that track their performance so and track their their health quantitatively, which we're going to be talking about in this in this podcast. Hope you enjoy the episode, and if you do, head over to uh, Ben's website and you can get on his list and start checking out his stuff as well. Thank you. All right, hey Ben, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Mike. Yeah, sure thing. I look forward to uh, going over some of the stuff. Mainly, I want to focus on some of the stuff that you talk about in your latest book, which is doing really well, called uh, Beyond Training. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so so in the book, you talk uh, a fair amount about overtraining and kind of under-recovering, um, and I run into that quite a bit. I, I, I run into it sometimes with my body, but I run into it a lot with people that I speak with. So I thought it'd be a, a good subject for us to, to talk about. So let's talk about the overtraining side of uh, that equation first. So what are some of the kind of easy to spot reliable indicators uh, of overtraining that, that we can watch for in our bodies that don't require fancy gadgets or, uh, you know, Jedi Sixth Sense or something? Uh, you know, if, if you're not paying attention to actual, you know, self quantification using something like heart rate variability or, you know, like, well, I think that's a good one. I mean, at least that's an easy, I know that there are some fancy machines out there that, you know, okay. All right. So, you know so I mean? if that, if that counts, because yeah. I was going to say, you know, that that'll cost you, I mean, you could literally get apps for like $4 and 99 cents off of iTunes. that will test heart rate variability, yeah. like, um, Azumio makes it one called the stress check and it uses the little camera lens on your like your iphone so mm -hmm. it's it's infrared um and it's not quite as accurate as wearing like a wireless heart rate monitor but a wireless heart rate monitor is going to be 60 70 bucks yeah. and something or even, like that or even those fit you know the activity trackers i think a couple of them on the market right now also have a heart rate monitor and people tend to like those no, none of them have heart rate variability really? that I'm aware of. Oh, okay. Yeah, because what you'd have to have is an infrared measurement that that goes through the uh, through the skin, mm -hmm. and um, there there is the ability to do that on your fingertip with the camera lens on your phone. It's a little bit inaccurate, but the only way to get it otherwise would be using a pretty fancy infrared sensor and there's there's a group out of Tel Aviv that's working with the United States Air Force actually to develop heart rate variability tracking for pilots to monitor stress in pilots mm. but their technology isn't really available to the masses yet once it is they'll be able to start putting heart rate variability tracking into stuff like you know Fitbits and and okay wearables and even like bike helmets and stuff like that but it's it's still kind of in its infancy I see. Um, maybe, and, maybe it's and, just my ignorance of what heart rate variability is exactly then yeah it, it's that honestly like that's the number one way that i keep track of my own training status and whether or not i need to kind of like take a few days to super compensate and recover mm -hmm. or whether i can kind of throw a few more uh curve balls on my body on any given day but it, it's essentially the amount of time that occurs in between each of your heartbeats. Okay. And and technically, that amount of time, that delta, should vary slightly from heartbeat to heartbeat. There should be slight little variations in heart rate variability, meaning a high amount of variability is a right. good thing. Okay. And if that's not occurring, then what that means is that your nervous system is not that robust that the actual vagus nerve feeding into the, um, the, the SA node in your heart 
causing like the, the pacemaker activity in your heart to take place, mm-hmm. the tone in that vagus nerve is off, either due to sympathetic nervous system overtraining or parasympathetic nervous system overtraining. So what that means is that uh, your heart rate variability is either going to be suppressed, and you'll typically see that in like um, – aerobic athletes, endurance athletes who are just like doing too much training, just like it's just straight up like aerobic overreaching or overtraining. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes like you'll tend to see some, some decent heart rate variability, um, measurements in terms of high amounts of heart rate variability in like CrossFitters and athletes who are overtraining with intensity. Mm -hmm. A lot of times their heart rate variability is high enough, but it bounces around a bunch from day to day. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, that the sympathetic nervous system is a little bit uh, out of whack, to use the highly scientific term. <laughs> um, it's super easy way. I mean, like, RA variability, I would say, would, would be my number one. Okay. Um, and how, do, how does that play out? So we get the app, we, we you know, check. Does the app have it all built in? It would just tell us? Or do we, do we yeah. need to interpret the results? Um, there are some apps like uh, the uh, Omega Wave and the BioForce. And those will just like they're they're like green, yellow, red apps, right? Like green is like go, you're good to train. Yellow is kind of be careful today. Maybe make it an easy day where you know you're you're gonna either reduce weights or reduce intensity or reduce volume. And then red is just like don't train today. You know, go take a bath or whatever. Cool. So well, that's useful uh, also for just recovery purposes because I find that uh, you know the majority of my of my exercise is intense weightlifting and that's it would be a lot of the a lot of my crowd you know are, are weightlifters um, and every couple of months depending on what I'm doing it could be every four weeks or so and somewhere between every four and eight weeks I just start to get uh, a bit run down I feel a bit you know uh, fatigued in the gym my weights go down a little bit less energy and and I always just kind of played it you know by that and then I have to take a few days off and then I feel good again uh, yeah, but I definitely yeah. pick up one of these apps, and and I want to see how that correlates to to actual uh, numbers, you know. Yeah, and I've used my heart rate variability to really be able to pinpoint the fact that I can I can keep it pretty high with one full rest day per week, and then one day of really active recovery. And by active recovery, I mean some of the active recovery methods I talk about in the book, like cold thermogenesis and hypoxia and sauna and things that that are still making your body better, mm. but that are are not as intensive as weight training or, or road work or something like that. Yeah. Um, I also like uh, a pulse ox. Like you can, you can get a fingertip pulse oximeter at, at any drugstore, and you want to look for a number, preferably that's about ninety six up to ninety nine percent for your your um, oxygenation levels. Right. Uh, and that's again cheap, easy, simple. You roll over, you put that thing on, you check in the morning, and if it's suppressed, typically it's because you drank too much the night before or you're you're overtrained or overreached and that's another decent sign that you should take a recovery day um those are two pretty simple self-quant devices devices and then just like qualitatively um you know you, you can always look at the things that, that you see about like i don't i don't want to preach the stuff that that you're reading about everywhere anyways these days like you know how much sleep are you getting and are you yeah. in a good mood and is your appetite dysregulated like all that stuff's pretty intuitive yeah honestly yeah like if just you, the net the net effect is you just kind of feel like shit <laughs> yeah you should check out um there, there's one website i like that kind of pulls in a lot of that intuitive stuff and actually gives you a, a pretty good running algorithm like a daily score and you just <laughs> log in each day it's like how do i feel today how do i sleep less night how my soreness levels etc like and uh, that one's called Restwise. um it's another one i talk about in the book in a little bit more detail but it's just like 11 things that you kind of say each day and, it, and you know it takes up about 10 minutes of your day and um it, it gives you this running score yeah eventually they're going to put heart rate variability into their algorithm too but it's not in there right now but pulse oximetry is cool that's great i'm going to start doing that myself just because I'm, like I said, I'm curious on just putting some numbers to how I feel because I've always just kind of done it by feel or, um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's also been like, you know, with, for instance, on, on my Bigger Than or Stronger program, it just seems most people, except for people that are brand new to it, seem can they can go a bit longer. But as once you get grooved in, it seems every eight or nine weeks or so, that's just when it's time to take three, four days off or, or 
or do it more like a deload where you're dramatically reducing the intensity of your workouts for for a week and then you feel good again and you can get going so it'll be interesting to put, yeah. some, put some numbers to that yeah and i mean like for event-based athletes I f you're, you're going to be doing those deload weeks during a taper week typically right you know for, for me i'm competing every four to six weeks and so i've always got naturally worked into the competitive cycle anything from a four to seven day taper going into an event mm -hmm. but for for long periods of time like let's say a winter off season where i might have three months without an event um, I personally find that I do better with one to two deload days a week mm -hmm. and then consistent training with no full deload weeks mm -hmm. rather than hard training, digging yourself into a super deep hole with daily training and then a full deload week. So I, I like a little bit more of a micro cycle with, you know, like a, like a, um, you know, three day on one day off, two day on one day off type of, type of approach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I do that as well where I'm not training seven days a week. There's just no way that I could, um, my normal week would be five or six days, depending on what I'm doing with my diet. Of course, if you're in, if I'm in a calorie deficit, I'm going to be training a little bit less just overall. I have to reduce frequency and reduce volume a little bit. Um, but, but you're, 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 you're training mainly, are you doing, are you talking both weightlifting and endurance or just endurance? Well, yeah, I mean, I, most of my training really is a, is a pretty concurrent training approach just because right now I'm training for obstacle racing. Right. So, you know, typical workout for me, I'm, I'm carrying stones and tire flipping mixed right in with hill sprints and, okay. and plyos. So, um, so, so for me, it's, it's mostly a combination training. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Okay. So that's, uh, that's great. That's on the, on the, you know, overtraining side. Now, what are some of your favorite ways to speed up recovery? I mean, obviously there's rest and proper nutrition. Everybody knows that, but what else have you found is, uh, helpful for, for just getting your, not, it's not just your muscles, but like you said, it is your nervous system. And, you know, there are various theories out there regarding, you know, is, is, is overtraining just, uh, is it more of a mental thing or is it a central governor type thing? But, uh, I don't know from what I've read on that, it seems like it's still just a bit confusing right now. And all we know is, over time, as you push yourself, if you're not recovering adequately, you're not going to feel very good and you're going to have to take some time off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, let me, let me first clarify that most people aren't overtrained. It's very rare that I run into a truly overtrained athlete. And usually when you are overtrained, you are dug deep into a hole. Mm -hmm. Most, most people are overreached. Um, so you're, you're to that stage where the adrenals are still producing high amounts of cortisol. If you were to get a blood or a salivary cortisol measurement, you're still pumped up with cortisol, but you're to the stage where you've got chronically elevated cortisol levels, which, which are going to do things like decrease your cell receptor sensitivity to thyroid hormone. And they're going to decrease the ability of total testosterone to debind from sex hormone binding globulin. So you have lower levels of free testosterone and right. You know, kind of a little bit of a blah feeling, less drive, sometimes a dip in metabolism from the thyroid issue, but it's not true overtraining mm. where the adrenals are no longer even producing cortisol. And you can't, like you can't, for example, mobilize liver glycogen unless you dump a bunch of caffeine into your body mm. and you can't get your blood glucose levels up enough to even feel like getting out of bed unless you're actually eating like higher amounts of carbohydrates. So you start to get like chocolate cravings and sugar cravings and fruit cravings and you know all sorts of nasty stuff happens when you're truly overtrained. Mm. And in a case like that, I mean, it, it takes four to six full on deload weeks and everything from like Tai Chi to nine to 10 hours of sleep a night to digging into things that actually cause the adrenal glands to start producing cortisol again, like mm. ginseng and licorice root and all these herbs. So, I mean, like most people honestly are smart enough to stop before yeah. they get that far into a hole. Um, some of the things I like though, to, to keep yourself from getting there in the first place, um, one from a from a gear standpoint, um, I'm a big fan of cold thermogenesis gear or just cold thermogenesis in general. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like I'm wearing right now um, compression pants, and they're just like these super duper tight compression pants because I spend most of my day at a standing workstation, but I can pack these with ice. So when I pack them with ice, that helps with uh, with. Uh, removal of inflammation right. and enhances recovery. Yeah, but it also. I'm sure you're familiar with Hyperice and their products. 
Um, no. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's I you, you'd like it. It's uh, iced compression wraps. Yeah, and and, and I, actually, I like you it. really sh- you really shouldn't ice without hydrostatic pressure from from underwater icing, um, or else ice with compression sleeves because otherwise, the vasoconstriction that you get from ice can ox- it, it can cause some lymphatic backflow, which can actually inhibit recovery. Hmm. So ice should always be combined with either uh, hydrostatic pressure from being in water. Uh, or, or under a really steady flow of water, or uh, basically like the the compression sleeves. Like you should never just like ice your joints uh, with like a Ziploc bag full of ice or some frozen vegetables or whatever. So compression with ice, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. I'm a big that, fan. That's of, the hyper ice things. You check it out. You'll like them. Yeah, I just made a note to myself to yeah. go check it out. Yeah. Um, another one that I like is electrical muscle stimulation. Like using a Mark Pro or a Compex, like if you're in a car or an airplane or you're sitting around. Like my wife and I watched a movie last night and I had the Mark Pro running on my legs during the movie. Um, and you know, I, I had a, a tough rock session yesterday afternoon with a weighted vest and, and uh, you know, just knew I could use that extra recovery since I was going to be sitting around anyways. So I like electrical muscle stimulation. Another one I like is inversion. Um, inversion tables are super easy to use, super easy to get your hands on. Those can help drain the legs really, really well. Mm-hmm. And like you hang from an inversion table for five to ten minutes, then can be a night and day difference, especially in any workout that you're doing, uh, like speed for or, or running for. Um, so from a from a gear standpoint, those are some of the ones I like, like inversion, cold thermo, EMS. There are some things that I do for sleep too, like uh, I, I sleep with you know using like this grounding method or earthing method. Hmm. Um, you know, a lot a lot of Tour de France cyclists were the were the first athletes who use that to recover in between stages. And what is and that can, exactly? Just to explain for everybody. Basically, what you've got is uh, an electrochemical gradient that tends to be best kept in balance when you're uh, touching earth because you you get a, a release of negative ions. From natural geology and you know from from the Earth's magnetic field, and when you aren't in touch with Earth or you're flying or you're standing inside on concrete, you're not really getting a lot of that natural recovery that would occur from a restoration of a normal electrochemical gradient. So you get that when you're sleeping, and, right. and you get this release of negative ions when you're sleeping. I use something called a, an Earth pulse; just goes underneath my my mattress. Um, another thing that I'll take naps on in the afternoon is something called a biomat. And that's, uh, you may be familiar with like infrared saunas yeah, sure. for releasing, uh, or for enhancing release of growth hormone and accelerating, uh, temperature and yeah. recovery. Yeah. I talked about the flow. saunas in, in, in a podcast yeah. with, uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, if you're familiar with her. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we she she's kind of more into like the, the heat shock proteins yeah. and, and cardiovascular effect of, of saunas. Um, when you look at things from like a hormonal standpoint, there are some cool things that you get from infrared sauna exposure that you don't get from like a dry sauna or a wet sauna or just yeah. the pure heat. I've heard that. Uh, I just haven't looked into the research. So I just yeah. you know whenever I hear anything these days, I'm just like, well, it sounds good, but I don't know. Like, who, yeah. who knows? I have to see what what kind of research is out there. Yeah, so I sleep on an infrared mat. Okay. Uh, I, I don't sleep on. It, I nap on it. Um, and then I just, I just tuck it away and I don't sleep on during the night cause it actually can get kind of hot. You wake up at like 1am just covered in sweat. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I, but I do take naps on that. And then the other thing is from a dietary standpoint, I'm a huge fan of either nutrient dense supplements or nutrient dense food. So yes. by nutrient dense supplements, I mean things like phytoplankton. Um, that's a bit like I do a few drops of phytoplankton every day. Mm-hmm. Um, just a, as, as a super, super dense source of cells. Um, I'm also a fan of egg yolks, grass-fed beef. I do a lot of liver uh, to, to maintain levels of fat-soluble hormones. Um, do a lot of uh, dark, dark leafies, a lot of coconut oil. Um, basically, really, really nutrient-dense foods. It's, it's yeah. pretty rare that I that I eat a, a calorie-rich, nutrient-poor food. Like uh, I don't do a lot of a lot of bread, a lot of rice, things of that nature. Right. Yeah, yeah. I talk about because uh, you know in the in the bodybuilding or in, in the fitness world, if it fits your macros, is all popular these days. And a lot of people, you know, they real when when they learn that when you're talking body body composition, it's mainly just calories in, calories out, and then making sure you get enough protein. And then they use that as like, a, oh, well, I guess I can eat a box of Pop-Tarts a day and, and get lean without ever giving thought to 
the health side of things that food isn't yeah. just the food isn't just protein carbohydrates fat that the, the micronutrients are uh, just as important in the long run and yeah sure you can oh yeah you can I mean, lose weight and you can get lean and you can look okay eating junk food but let's see how you feel in six months and let's see yeah, how your performance is two perfect examples for that would be like you know high levels of chronically elevated blood glucose levels that you would get by just paying attention to macros and perhaps not paying attention to food quality can actually adhere to cholesterol particles and when you get glucose adhered to cholesterol particles, that allows a particle to become oxidized, which allows it to dig into an endothelial cell wall. Uh, cell wall. So that would that would result in something like atherosclerotic plaque formations in uh, you know coronary arteries, for example. Right. So that, and that's uh, that's been shown one issue in various that, research of high yeah. carbohydrate diets, especially a lot yeah, exactly. of high simple sugar diets. Yeah, which is which is one reason why you can see athletes get blood clots, um, even though they may be extremely healthy on the outside. An another result of that same type of glycation, which is what happens when sugar attaches to proteins or attaches to fats in your body, would be uh, the formation of advanced glycation end products in neural tissue, leading to early onset Alzheimer's and neural deficits. Uh, that, again, can occur no matter how strong or lean you are. Right. So... So yeah, I mean, there, there's some definite kind of health versus performance trade-offs when you look at things from, you know, that, that type of stuff is not just influenced by your macros and, and food quality, but also by, you know, other, other health choices like yes. stress and the amount of sleep that you get and the amount of, of electromagnetic field exposure that you expose yourself to during the day and, you know, toxins and pollutants and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, if you really want to be a healthy athlete, and that, that's why the title of my book is Beyond Training, mm. there's a bunch of stuff that goes above and beyond training because, I, like, I acknowledge in the first chapter of the book, like, you can you can be a fantastic athlete and not pay attention to many of these variables, but that doesn't mean that the quality of your life from about forty or fifty years old onwards is not going to totally suck. Yeah, yeah. Or, I think of like, uh, what is it? It was an NFL player, maybe yeah, as a wide receiver who. A buddy of mine, I don't really follow football much, but a buddy of mine said he got traded to some team and the, he eats McDonald's every day. And the, his joke was like, they're like, oh, how, how, how are you liking it over there? And he's like, they have McDonald's everywhere. I love it here. <laughs> like, and it's just like yeah. a genetic freak that at some point, though, his body's not going to, you know, it's just not going to be doing, uh, be able to do what it does. Yeah, I mean, you 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 see deficits that begin to. I mean, like let's let's say like like impotence or erectile dysfunction. Like that's a total canary in the mine. That's an indicator of a eventual decrease in your production of endothelial and nitric oxide and your ability to vasodilate. Mm. And the reason it's a canary in the mine is because erectile dysfunction often precedes heart attacks mm. because what you you get a little bit of vasodilation to. To, to those blood flow regions in the crotch and that's just a sign of the same thing going on up in the heart sure and you know that that's something that's influenced by food quality it's something that's influenced by by the amount of nitric oxide you're able to release and you know it's it's one of those things that you know it, it, you can still be a great athlete with erectile dysfunction <laughs> and then have a heart attack 10 years later so you know bad sex and then death you know, despite your performance or your, or your body comp. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so another thing the book you talk about is kind of customizing your diet to fit your uh, body and performance goals. I mean, you talked a little bit about that in terms of how you eat. Is there anything else that, uh, you can tell us kind of more about that? Yeah, that, that particular, um, section of the book is basically about, you know, for example, older athletes, younger athletes, females, vegans, et cetera, how to customize your diet. Like, let's say, um, I know a lot of people are talking about vegans and, and stuff these days. So let's talk about like senior athletes, for example, right. like as you, as you get older. So you naturally produce less hydrochloric acid as you get older. And uh, hydrochloric acid is what's necessary to actually activate pepsin, which is the enzyme that breaks down proteins. And so you, you tend to see uh, low levels of blood amino acids and inadequate protein absorption in older athletes. Yeah, when which is why research has shown they need more protein, or that's one way of going about yeah. it, I guess. If you're not going to improve the digestion, they got to eat more. 
yeah, you you either eat more or you improve digestion or or preferably do a, a little bit of both. Right. Um, you know, along with just chewing chewing your food more completely. Incidentally, it it, it helps to to take more time to eat as you get older. Yeah. Um so so ultimately, you know, customizing the diet for a senior athlete, that would mean doing something like, you know, eating lemons or taking taking a digestive enzyme uh prior to your main meals of the day when you may not have needed to do that when you were a younger athlete. Right. And, you know, I personally do a gut test once a year and I'm starting to notice mild deficits in my pancreatic enzyme production and also a little bit of an elevation of fatty acids and triglycerides in my stool. And one, and one of the things that can cause that are the, just the gradual enzymatic deficiencies that can occur as you age. Right. So I'm being a little bit more careful. You know, I, I buy lemons now whenever I go to the grocery store and I have a little bit of lemon like lemon juice and some lemon wedges before I eat. And I'm even starting to include digestive enzymes with some of my big meals just to help me along with that. And, yeah. and that's one of the things you take into account when you're a senior. Another would be minerals. My parents do the same um, thing. I mean, they're, I wouldn't say they're athletes. Yeah. They've been in exercise in their whole life, but they found as they aged that uh, enzymes where they would have, it would have never done anything for them or, or they never would have noticed it when they're younger. Now they definitely notice it with certain types of foods. And Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Um, minerals would be another um, just just the basic loss of osteoblastic activity and 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 bone mineral loss as you age. Um, I'm a big fan of like trace liquid minerals, uh, sea salts, kind of going out of your way to get extra minerals in your diet like that uh, 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 phytoplankton stuff I talked about mm -hmm. and any other sea vegetables are really good sources of minerals. But kind of going out of your way as you get older to include a lot of those things in your diet is also a, a pretty prudent move to make. Um, and, you know, just, just getting on enzymes, using lemon juice, getting on minerals, like those are some of the things that you should think about doing as you age is just one example of, of, uh, a way you can customize your diet. Yeah, that's great. Um, you had mentioned veganism. We don't have to dive into it, the, to the whole subject. Cause we're kind of, I know you're, you have to, you have to be on another call soon, but, um, I, I get asked about it, you know, uh, semi-frequently. And what are your thoughts on on uh, vegan eating and performance? Because I mean, there are of course inherent uh, drawbacks, the inherent micronutrient deficiencies that you're going to have to account for. And then there, you know, it's hard to balance macronutrients. Like try try to get enough protein without using a supplement uh, and without exploding your carbs and fats. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I would say like, like there's there's a lot. I go over about twelve different kind of deficits and issues that vegans need to address in the book. Right. Um, I would say some of the some of the biggies would be uh, you know, and, and I I test a lot of athletes. I work for Wellness FX, so I I look at the uh, the lab profiles from a lot of athletes, both vegans and meat eaters. Vegans, I I tend to see vitamin B twelve deficiencies almost across the board. Yeah, it's so. Different. Um, so that, that's one biggie is, is getting on, on a good B12 supplement and, uh, preferably something that's got a really absorbable form of folate in it. Um, another one would be creatine, like five grams creatine a day. Yeah. Um, you know, like, and, and you can find good vegan sources of creatine too. There's one, uh, actually I, I'm taking creatine right now. I use, uh, uh, Creo2 okay. from, uh, from Millennium Sports. That's a pretty good one. It's got some, some cordyceps in it as well. So creatine and B12 would be a couple. Um, carnosine, that's another one that's that's found only in animal foods mm. that if you're going to be a vegan athlete, you should consider supplementing with. Um, and then DHA is another biggie for for uh, neural system uh, integrity. Yeah. Uh, DHA is huge for neural tissue. It's also really, really important for myelination. And um, you know, if you look at the plant form of omega threes, ALA, that's pretty inefficiently converted to DHA. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, like, you using using like you just supplement with fish oil, or what do you do? Uh, you can use algae. You can use like uh, chlorella, spirulina. Um, there's some some pretty good like 100% organic sources of that type of stuff. You want to yeah. be really careful not to go to the bargain bin at the at the super supplement store for for those things because like they they can be really laden with uh, with heavy metals and toxins and stuff like that. So make sure you go organic if you go with a spirulina or chlorella. But that can be a pretty good source of DHA if you can convince a vegan athlete to use like a a fish oil or something like that. That's also, you know, a pretty good way to go. Like, yeah, sure. trying trying to hunt some down. I was just curious like a, if you use it because I, I take fish oil every day and and spirulina yeah. as well. Yeah, um, I I do take fish oil. I do about four grams a day. Yeah, um, I do you know, I, I I use chlorella almost every morning in my smoothie. 
you know, I usually have a can of sardines over a big ass salad at lunch. So, you know, I, I really go out of my way to, to get the DHA in. Um, but yeah, I'd say creatine, carnosine, DHA, um, vitamin B12. Those would be some of the biggies. Um, vitamin D would be the last one, but you know, you never want to take vitamin D unopposed uh, without adequate amounts of vitamin K2 and vitamin A. And that's one of the issues is that vitamin D can cause calcification and there can be some risks of vitamin D toxicity um, if if you're taking high amounts of vitamin D. So I I think the basic, like the simplest recommendation is just get your blood tested to see where you're at in vitamin D levels and get him up to, I guess these days that now the the minimum you'd want would be uh, 30 NG, what is it, NG per milliliter, I think it is. And then um, you want to, but but then newer research shows that being upwards of 50 is actually probably optimal. Yeah, and in athletes, I like to see 40 to 80. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, mo- most folks and, you know, even vegans can get around there with somewhere in the ballpark of 2,000 international units of D a day. Yeah. But that needs to be accompanied in about a one to two ratio with A. So you, you should be shooting for around 4,000 of A. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing is vitamin K2, 100 to 200 micrograms a day of vitamin K2. Right. That's kind of like that's kind of like the holy trilogy of fat soluble vitamins right there is a that two to one vitamin a to vitamin d ratio along with 100 to 200 vitamin k2 yeah that's exactly yeah. how i'm coming out with uh, with my supplement company uh, legion our multivitamins coming out and that's exactly what we have in it oh that's perfect nice yeah cool yeah okay so last but not least you talk about in the book about improving brain health and brain function um what are some uh easy ways that we can do this um, neuroplasticity is, is a big one in making sure that you introduce uh, variety and novelty and challenge on a regular basis. And that can mean straying outside the comfort zone of your sport a lot of the time. Right. So, you know, for, for me, for like obstacle training, um, I'm, I'm getting, you know, some, some walls and ropes and carries and stuff like that thrown at me, but I try and challenge myself in other physical and mental ways as well. So I play tennis twice a week so that I'm engaged in a ball sport that requires mm. eye tracking and peripheral vision yeah. and some of those skills I'm not developing with obstacle training. Um, I took up golf recently again. So yeah, <laughs> the, golf, the golf most frustrating is frustrating sport. Yeah, exactly. Um, another another thing that can help out with that is brain games, brain aerobics. Right. So um, I like Lumosity and end back. Like when I'm standing in line at the grocery store or um, you know waiting in the, at the airport, I'll, I'll whip out something like that rather than surfing through the emails on my phone just right. for a quick little brain training. I'm also a huge fan of music for that. Um, it, just listening to music and complex music can be pretty helpful for brain training, but I actually go out of my way to learn music. So I practice piano with my kids two times a week, That's and great. then I play guitar three times a week. And that helps me having to – it improves your, your visual perception and your eye tracking, having to basically look at the notes and go back and forth from the notes to where your hands are moving. But – uh, it, it's also incredible for learning and attention to detail, uh, memory, things of that nature. Um, and then the last thing that I do is I memorize stuff. So um, the way that, that I personally do it is I'll memorize like a quote or a Bible verse or something like that every morning. And I go back and try to remember that a few times during the day just to – I mean it's just like your body, right? If, yep. if you let your body – sit and atrophy and you don't send it a message that it's got to stay alive um if you don't use it you'll lose it and same thing with the brain you just send your brain a message a few times a day that you're going to challenge it outside of what it normally be expected to do and you know it's, it's a very very good way to keep your brain alive and you know i i get into a bunch of supplements and apps and and hacks and stuff like that in the book but i mean like you know when you look at things from a simple perspective just like some of those brain training apps like lumosity doing some music and then making sure you don't get stuck in the comfort zone from a physical activity standpoint or whatever sport you're training for. Yeah. Those would be some of the biggies. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's great. I think it's it's similar with training where you're going to get the majority of your benefits from things like that. You can't just take pills. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there are different nootropics and things that you, that, that can improve cognitive function, but just like with training, it's, you got to do the work Yeah, and with the brain that is doing the work. Yeah, and I, I think that's freaking ridiculous. Like the people who are infatuated with smart drugs, but won't go out of their way to just be uncomfortable. It's yeah. it's the same, you know. It, it's the same concept as the people who take the fat burning pills and don't exercise. It's like yeah, it's exactly it's one one dumb. weird trick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Okay, great. Well, um, this is awesome. Tons of good information here. I highly recommend you, the listener, that you check out Ben's book. As you can tell, he's very smart. And he knows what he's talking about, and there's all kinds of cool stuff in this book. I actually recommend it on, uh, I do a weekly series, like uh, Cool Stuff of the Week thing, where I recommend a book every week and some other various things, and I recommend it oh, sweet. Yeah, when it came out. Oh, dude. Nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot. I know you got to run to another call, so thanks a lot for taking the time, Ben, and uh, I'd love to have you on again sometime. I, I like speaking with people that know what they're talking about. Killer, dude. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Yeah, sure thing.